Hello students, today we're going to discuss federalism. Federalism, how do you spell it? F-E-D-E-R-A-L-I-S-M. Like a federal government, federalism. And let me make sure I'm writing in the right board. Federalism. Okay, so in federalism, what is it? What does federalism mean? Some of you will think, oh, federal government. Yeah, it has to do with federal government, but it is not all. Federalism means the division of power and functions. Division of power and functions between a federal government and the state government. So I'll give you examples so you would understand it better. Now you know that some states have legalized marijuana. Okay, but the federal government still considers marijuana as schedule one drug. So, is it wrong or is it right to use marijuana? It's a good question, right? Depending on which law. And, uh, well, when this happened with under Obama administration, Obama said, Obama's attorney general, said we're going to overlook as long as the states which have legalized the marijuana and the residents of the states use them inside and not transport it across state lines and we're going to focus on drugs coming out from outside the country so it depends on the administration at the same time with obama administration in arizona when state of Arizona passed a law against immigrants, illegal immigrants, as they call, coming through the border into the country, and Arizona empowered the police officers to stop any car which they see feel suspicious and not only check for driver license and other things, but also ask about the immigration status. Now that case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Why? Because immigration is part of the federal government, not the state government's job, right? So there's a division of powers. There's a competition. Push and pull, push and pull happens all the time. It's not just within federal government and state. Even inside a state, you would see, even though that's not exactly federalism, that city government and state government will have constant conflict. For example, New York City Mayor de Blasio and the state governor have conflicts. Like in who is supposed to say whether schools will reopen, when, when will the restaurants will be allowed to eat inside during a COVID time. So these are conflicts. Power, division of power and functions. That is federalism. I'll give you a difference between what we have is a federal system, as you know. And where does this federalism come from? The federalism comes from, write it down, from the Constitution. Not based on a provision, but the formatting, the format of the Constitution itself. We'll be talking about different parts of the Constitution today to understand federalism better. So there are two types of system, unitary, U-N-I-T-A-R-Y, unitary system versus federal system. Unitary system is, for example, France, the country France have, where the central government, the government in the middle, the national government will have all the powers. They won't give powers to the state and provinces. Whereas, for example, the French um, education minister one time said famously, I can look at my watch by the time of the day, I can tell what is being taught in French schools around the country. So they have already mandated exactly what should be taught in schools throughout the country. You think in America, the president or the educational uh, secretary can tell what is taught in every school, in every state. It varies because education belongs to the states in America. 
So the federal system is also in other countries like Switzerland, Canada, because it's diverse population and they want to have powers in determining certain things. Okay. And so let's talk about what are the advantages. The third one. Okay. Write it down. Next. The first one I told you what is the definition and example of federalism is. Second, I told you the difference between a unitary system and federal system. Third one is advantages of a national government policies. If you're letting a national government create policies, what are the advantages? The advantages are first, resources. They have a lot of resources. Federal government has money. State doesn't have as much money, right? Though because of the money, they could bring talent, bring experts, bring technology and other things to solve the problems. Whereas if you go to, well, let's discuss the second point of the national government and then we'll go to the state, advantages of state policies. The second one is national government also create policies which would protect minority rights, minority. So more of civil rights. Even in this country, if you look at it, who abolished slavery? Lincoln, right? And then the Congress passed the amendments. So it's a federal government, right? And further, 100 years later, when Martin Luther King marched, the federal government again stepped up and created Civil Rights Act, right? And even Brown versus Board of Education, it's the Supreme Court of the United States, which, which stopped discrimination or segregation in schools. So the federal government is a champion of equality for all. That means minorities will not be discriminated, so the policies. But there are advantages to state government policies. First one, state government policies, write it down, so it could be like a five, power, uh, four, state policy advantages. The state's advantages, the first one is it's innovative because many innovations start in the small level and it grows. For example, federal government did not legalize same-sex marriage before the states did. So the first state to do was Massachusetts, yes. And it spread one by one to other states before the federal government stepped in. I'll talk about that later. Okay, innovation in environmental policy. Many innovations happen in the small level and from bottom up, it'll grow. So state has, state government policies have advantages. The second advantage is, is civil liberties are protected, not necessarily always but it is usually said the federal government has more power and it could violate individual your and my civil liberties which would be like freedom of speech right freedom of press right to practice your religion all this could be violated by the federal government and states will not so state has the champion of civil liberties. Federal is champion of civil rights. Civil rights, civil liberty, right? We'll talk about that in civil rights and civil liberties exclusive discussion more in detail. But here now, we are just using that as an example to understand national policies versus state policies. Do you understand what a policy is? Policy is a course of action, right? In case you, you are a freshman and didn't know what policy is, that's okay, I'm explaining to you. It's a course of action. For a problem, a federal government will have a public policy. What to do if there's crime high? What policy should we do? States have, right? Policies. Federal government has policies. City government have policies. Okay, so now you understand two, two advantages of the national government versus the state government. Next one we're gonna talk about is powers of national government. So you could write down that as fifth point. Powers of national government. Okay. Where do these powers come from? 
national government. Federalism is the division of powers and functions between national government and state government. Yeah, yeah. But who gives the power to the national government? You're right. The Constitution. The Constitution gives the powers. So where does it say in the Constitution certain powers are given to the federal government? This is about, okay, first one, A. Write it down, A. It's called expressed powers. Expressed, expressed, expression. Expressed powers, okay? What is an expressed powers? Powers which are clearly mentioned in the Constitution that it belongs to the federal government. Those are expressed powers, clearly expressed. State government cannot compete or nobody can say that does belong to the federal government that belongs to the state. No, that's no division in there. For example, we'll be declaring war. Declaration of war, who does that in the United States? Congress, not New York Assembly, not City Hall of New York City. They can't go to war. Congress, the federal government decides and the commander in chief leads the army, right? If you would have said the president declares war, Mm -mm -mm, wrong. Congress declares the war. If you have said Congress, that's correct. Congress declares war. That's explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. Coining money, printing money. Can the state government print money? No. Federal government can print money. They have the power. They also regulate commerce between the states and with foreign governments. Trade. So Trump, when he talks about um, um, trade decisions with China, only federal government can do that. It's an expressed powers, clearly mentioned in the constitution. And, and so it belongs to them. Where does it mention? Article one, article one of the constitution. That's like chapter one in a, in a book, okay? If you want to have an analogy. Article one talks exclusively about Congress. Article two is about the presidency. Article three is about the Supreme Court, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Article one, section eight, which is the section, different sections in articles. Section eight mentions that there are powers, boom, 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 belong to Congress, like the ones I aforementioned, which include printing of money, declaring war, commerce, yada, yada, yada. Okay, there are about 17 powers expressed clearly then what are the other powers the, the federal government has? B, in that, under the same section, we're gonna discuss three major powers in the, in the constitution of the federal government. So we already talked about express powers. A, B is necessary and proper clause. Necessary and proper clause. And it is also called elastic clause. Elastic, like elasticity, rubber band. So why is it called necessary and proper clause? This is that powers which are not clearly mentioned in the Constitution, but powers which the federal government can have based on the necessity. Oh, yeah. And they could use that. For example, the, the I'll tell you a case. Uh, the federal government does, the constitution did not say the federal government could have banks, right? But federal government created banks, national banks. The big proponent, supporter of that is Alexander Hamilton because he believed in a strong federal government. He believed federal government can do a lot of good things and a strong federal government is essential for the success of America. Whereas if you talk to Thomas Jefferson, his rival, he didn't believe in a strong federal government. He believed in state government having powers, state government, okay? So because Hamilton believed in a strong federal government, you need a lot of money to do a lot of good things. He believed in state bank, uh, sorry, a federal government having banks. So after Hamilton's death, okay, in 1819, there was a court case because there was a federal bank in Maryland. And Maryland has borrowed from the federal bank, didn't, couldn't pay it back. The Maryland started taxing the bank, just like it taxes any businesses. But Mer that bank's in charge, guy named 
McCollage. I'm going to spell it here so that I don't butcher his pronunciation. Here, M C McCollage. O U C H. Do you see that? The last one is a H. McCollage. Versus Maryland. This is a very famous Supreme Court case. Maryland, you know how to spell the state of Maryland. He sued the state of Maryland and the court case went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ruled in favor of the federal government using the necessary and proper clause saying that federal government has the power even though it's not clearly mentioned in the Constitution that it could create a bank, it could use certain powers over that of the state. So this bank could be created based on Commerce Clause. Commerce is regulated by the federal government. It is mentioned there, right? Using that implied that the bank could be created is the argument given by the justices of the Supreme Court. So that case was ruled in favor, favor of the federal government's power. Are you following? 1819, um, the, the Chief Justice was John Marshall. We'll talk about John Marshall later when we talk about federal courts. It's a great, there's a great case I will be talking about, Marbury versus Madison, not now. So you understand, necessary and proper clause, it is elastic, that means the federal government can stretch, stretch, stretch how much of a power they want using that clause. And you might think, why would they put that there? That will give enormous powers to the federal government. It was put by, proponent of that was, during Constitution, a man, a delegate from New Jersey. He's actually for state sovereignty, state rights, but he wanted to empower federal government so that they could have powers to do the good they could do in this world. Are you following? Elastic powers also called as necessary and proper clause. The third one, third one is called supremacy clause. Supremacy, S-U-P-R-E-M-A-C-Y, supremacy clause. Clause, when I say, some people spell it not bear clause, like Santa Claus with the E added at the end. Santa Claus, C-L-A-U-S-E, clause, okay? Supremacy clause talks about if, say, I'm the federal government and you are a state government, I create a law on a particular issue. You create a law on a particular issue. But those both laws are different than which law could be applied. You got it. Supremacy clause means the federal government law applies, not the state's law. Supremacy, whichever is supreme. The federal government is supreme. Supremacy clause. Are you following? So those are the three you need to understand when it comes to federalism in terms of national government's powers in the Constitution. But there are also powers given to states, which are mentioned in the Constitution, which we're going to talk about. Write it down. St powers of state government. Okay? Powers of state government. And in the powers of state government, which is sixth point, I assume, if you're keeping track, A... The first one is reserved powers. Reserved. When I say reserve, like reservation. Yeah, reserved powers. And in reserved powers, where does it say certain powers are reserved for the state government? It's in the 10th Amendment. You know that Constitution was amended, right? 27 times so far. And in that first 10 amendments are called you got it right. Bill of Rights. So Bill of Rights, the first ten, ten amendments, were put, added to the Constitution by the anti-federalists because they feared the central government or the federal government will have enormous powers which will violate the individual liberty of the people. So they put that as a check against the federal government to check the power of the federal government. So they said, we will approve this constitution only if you add this Bill of Rights to the constitution. And Madison and others said, okay, okay, yeah, sure. And they added it after the constitution was amended. The constitution was approved. Ratification, it's called. The 10th amendment of the constitution, in simple words, is 
if there are powers which are not directly given to the federal government and if those powers are not curtailed for state government or that means stopped that they're saying like oh state government also would not have this then those powers belong to the state and the people if the federal government if the powers is if certain powers you can't mention everything in the constitution because they, they sat for a, one summer and wrote this right you cannot write think about everything so if it's not mentioned as powers given to the federal government and if it's not mentioned clearly as this shouldn't be given to the state government then those powers belong to the state and the people is the 10th amendment okay what does that mean in reality in reality so education is not mentioned in the constitution that means it won't belong to the federal government and it is not restricted to the state government that means it will belong the power will belong to educate its people will belong to the state that's why states will are educating its people you go to each state states educate not the federal government and you might ask wait a minute but the federal government has an education department i'll come to that i'll come to that okay i'll come to that but in general who is educating okay and cops you don't have federal cops yes there are federal officers but usually policing are the people okay belong to the state and city that is even local government state government gives powers to the local government that local government is new york city government is a local government and the city government acts on it so it it says nypd it doesn't say uspd right it's new york police department you go to texas there's the dallas police department right houston police department cities have it but the state gives them right and of course state troopers are there so and many of the prisoners are in the state the criminal courts are written for the state government state government has the power to regulate and many laws marriage if you go and get married in city hall you get the certificate from the state you from the city and from the state uh, approval by the powers vested on me by the state blah 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 the man, you i pronounce you man and wife it doesn't say by the united states government marriage and divorce are regulated by the state state government and properties you go property taxes differ from state to state right in fact state gets their revenue big revenues from the property taxes right some states do not have income tax yeah there are five states florida new hampshire wyoming all those states do not have state tax so they can decide they can decide how to do business there are more powers given to the state government why because you don't want so many powers to the federal government one it's it's far away and it's like oppressive the fear second they're already freaking loaded with so many issues dealing with foreign policy war and all these things you don't want small issues also to be dealt by them you want local government there's more trust in the public among local governments and little lesser trust for the state government and when you go to the federal government the trust goes down among public because they are far away and they cannot be trusted and there are multiple other reasons i don't want to go in here in this lecture why the public has less trust for federal government compared to local governments trust of what trust of that they will do good to the public yeah okay we talked about reserve powers now i'm going to talk about another power the state government has concurrent powers concurrent c o n current like electricity current one word concurrent that means parallel parallel powers concurrent powers yes one example is taxation both the federal government and the state government has that power waging a war only federal government has state doesn't have whereas taxing both have 
yeah, I told you some states don't have state tax, but that state decides that. And you might ask, well, how do they get their revenue then? Uh, they get their revenue in property tax. So those states, those states have a lot of property taxes. Anyway, that's a different conversation. But you understand what I'm saying. So states have concurrent powers and reserve powers. This is how you go. Now write down the next one. States obligation, seventh point, seventh point, right? If you're keeping track. States obligation to one another. This is in the Constitution. Where in the Constitution? Remember Article 1 is Congress. Article, this is the more written in Congress because a lot of powers are given to Congress, not to the President. Article 2 is Presidency. Article 3, the courts. Article 4, Section 1, is about the state's obligation to one another. Like what? There's a clause, again, CLA, U-S-E, clause called Full Faith and Credit Clause. Write it down. Full Faith and Credit Clause. What does that mean? Full faith and credit. That means if you are in New York, you have somebody who is stalking you, you get a restraining order against them, you move to New Jersey, and the stalker comes, will that law apply? Will the state New Jersey upholds the restraining order given by New York? Yes, they should. Just like uh, sometimes I, you have a driver's license in New York, you drive through another state, want to go to LA, they could stop you, pull over you, they look at your license, you might be in Nevada, and still, oh, New York license, they give you back. They don't say, oh, this is not Nevada license, I'm going to arrest you, you're driving without a license. That's full faith and credit. They will value and approve what one state has done. Okay? Full faith and credit class. Now, this gets into trouble in certain pro certain issues. Like what? <laughs> like, for example, I told you early, earlier, Massachusetts legalized gay marriage, right? At 2005. And even in 2015, there were only 37 states legalized same-sex marriage. Whereas 13 states have created laws that says we don't approve same-sex marriage. A lot of them are southern states, right? And the federal government also hasn't approved same-sex marriage. So full faith credit clause means if, a, if, say, a man named Sam is married to Peter in New York and he goes to a state which they don't recognize same-sex marriage, he could claim, hey, full faith and credit. What New York valid? You should approve that, right? That's why in 1990s, 95, 96, DOMA was created, Defense of Marriage Act, okay? DOMA. This is the federal government said states which do not recognize same-sex marriage do not need to recognize the marriages conducted in the states where it is approved. And federal government will not approve same-sex marriage. Yeah, they did. A DOMA. And same-sex marriage couples will not be eligible for Social Security or Medicare given by the federal government. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Then one person challenged it. It Windsor, United States versus Windsor. It went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ruled on the basis of 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment is a due process amendment that he is equal. Same-sex couple has the same rights as that of opposite sex couples, right? Heterogeneous couple. So they, same-sex couple should be recognized. Then, boom. <laughs> Two-year anniversary that Windsor, US, United States versus Windsor, the cases. Two-year anniversary of that, right? Four people sued. 
one of the guys, I know their stories. They they were married, same sex guys, married in one state, which it was legal, went to Ohio and one of the guys died. And in the death certificate, the other spouse wants him to be listed as a spouse. But the Ohio said, we don't recognize same sex marriage. He said, you, sh you should give me the death certificate saying I'm a spouse because it was I am married legally in another state. He took it to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court, it's, it's the case is called Obergefell. How do you spell it? It's a very unique name. Ober, O B E R G E F E L L. Obergefell versus Hodges, H O D G E S. One of the names, the difference is a clerk who is supposed to give the certificate. Yeah, sometimes the names become landmark cases. Went to Supreme Court. Supreme Court, same on the 14th Amendment, ruled they have the right and same-sex marriage based on Supreme Court ruling become legal throughout all 50 states and in the federal government. Now, I even had in the past a student of mine, of course, I'm not going to name name, from another country who got married to another guy and got green card. Federal government gives the green card, not the state, right? Immigration. Got a green card. Later, he will be eligible for citizenship. Before, you, could, you, you can only marry man and a woman and get green card, not same sex. So all because of the ruling of the Supreme Court. And so it's part of the federal government and it ruled in base of the 14th Amendment, okay? And now, so we talked about states' obligation to one another uh, using Article 4, Section 1, right? There's another Section 2, Article 4, Section 2. It's like it's paragraph 2, okay? Article 4, Section 2. It's called Comity Class. Comity, how do you spell? C-O-M-I-T-Y, Comity Class. What does that mean? Comedy class says, just like the full faith and credit clause, it says a state cannot discriminate residents of another state and give privileges to their own residents. So if I'm a, I'm a New Yorker, if I move to Virginia and Virginia discriminates me because I'm from New York and gives privileges to only Virginians, I could sue that, sue Virginia. And the case will go, if possible, to Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will strike it down based on the comedy class. Alaska had a case, 1970, actually. In 1970, Alaska uh, gave job opportunities in the pipelines to Alaskans. It's preferred Alaskans over those new people moving there. So it was sued and Alaska lost. Supreme Court rules it. Similarly, in the comedy class, there's another case in the 1950s and a man escaped from Alabama, he's a prisoner, came to the Northern state and he said in Southern states, there's cruel and unusual punishment, which is the Eighth Amendment, which says Eighth Amendment of the Constitution, no cruel and unusual punishment. Based on no cruel and unusual punishment, they are very cruel and unusual punishments. I don't want to go back to Alabama. I, I, I don't want to go back. So the state should have, but the states are supposed to give back the prisoner. And they gave back. This was a 1952 Alabama case. Okay, so that's the comedy class. Now you understand? Okay, now let's talk about types of federalism. I don't know what's this number, nine, ten, I don't know. Write it down. Types of federalism. Types of federalism, we're going to talk about three types and we are done. We are done the lecture. The first type of federalism is traditional federalism. Uh, when I say types, this is during the history of the United States. So 
this first type started from 1789 or 89 87 constitution 89 george washington presidency started federal government 89 up till 1930s it's traditional which is most of the powers belong to the state education i told you already marriage and divorce laws criminal courts all this even road transportation everything yeah that's why state troopers right in even highways yeah no it doesn't say u.s troopers no in traditional federalism an analogy is <laughs> if you eat cake layered cake you know layered cake I'll draw if you freaking like me. It's lactose intolerance and don't eat much cakes. Uh, I will draw the layered cake. I'm not a great artist, so bear with my bad. Yeah. So like this. Yeah, you're laughing, I hear you. Layered cake, say this is federal government, this is federal government, this is state government. They stand and do so one does not violate another. This is how it was, layered cake, from 1789, okay, to 1930s. What happened in 1930s? That changed, the second form of federalism came. Big depression, and FDR was elected. So when FDR got elected, a different type of federalism started. That's called cooperative, you know how to spell cooperation, cooperative federalism. In cooperative federalism, the federal government cooperated with the states to help the state government do its functions. Remember powers and functions, it's a division. Like what? Well, because a lot of unemployment, federal government created new policies, FDR. The policies together are called New Deal new deal so he created a lot of these policies and put forward and he got the money federal government okay and he used this money it's called categorical aid categorical grants categorical that means conditional based on conditions i'll give you the, i'm the fdr you're the state governor say then i will say i will give you the money if you use that money in the way i want and well, big depression, you are desperate, so you agree. Otherwise, I won't give the money. And so you take the money and you use it. You use it as I, the federal government wanted. Okay? Now, that's good. It helped for that time period. But in 1980, it changed. Even before the 1980, in the 1950s, it started creating the new, new things started coming, a new idea. Well, it's not a new idea. It's an idea from the 19th century. I'll tell you what it is. State rights, it was revoked. Uh, it, it was um, resurrected, not revoked, resurrected. New, there was an idea from the 19th century. This was a guy named John Calhoun. He was a senator, U.S. senator from the South and he was a big supporter of slavery. Yeah, right. Sla slavery was practiced in the South, right? So whenever the federal government wants to intervene in slavery, he will say the federal government has no power in controlling the life of the Southerners. It's our rights, state rights, and state has the power to rule something as unconstitutional if it violates our form of life. life. State rights. So this 1950s, Again, the state rights were brought back, okay? And so the state rights proponents will say limiting the federal government, federal government cannot tell us what to do with the money you give. We have the power to do what we want because you cannot tell us what to do with our education. It's the powers are with us. You cannot tell how to run our state jails our legal system, 
our our roads you know in the 1950s is when uh, eisenhower when he became president he created all the highways you see around america was built during the time and like 90% was federal government money 10% state government money we laid the roads yeah and most of them are dilapidated now and we need to renew it all that is a whole different topic of discussion but the point is that new idea the resurrected idea started rising in 1980 ronald reagan became the president ronald reagan ran for office and he will be campaigning saying the scariest words to hear is that i am here from the federal government and i'm here to help you so he painted he is running for the president of the united states but he painted he was the governor of california he painted the federal government as the scariest one because federal government get out of the way remember small government values jefferson values what small state rights and small government alexander hamilton believed in a strong federal government that's correct so ronald reagan brought this back and this is called new federalism new federalism which is up till now from 1980 onwards where the federal government can give money but you cannot dictate what the money should be used so ronald reagan created block grants instead of categorical grants block b l o c k block grants just give the money and don't ask us or tell us dictate us what to do the states will do what they think is the right thing you follow and so there it was clearly new federalism created now what is the right way to divide the power between the federal government and the state government and inside the states between the state and the cities and municipal government there's no formula there's no exact rule it's a division based on who is in office what the people feel how it happens based on issues okay i'll continue the conversation good luck